So thank you all very much. My name is Kwabinat Mensa. I'll be presenting on the ethics of facial recognition technology. I'm a master's student uh, in the Earth Science Department at ETH. Um, I'd like to start off by giving a bit of context why we need some form of biometric forms of identification and why identification even be, uh, it's even a, it's even an issue in, in countries and also in societies. So basically, um, due to like expansion of populations and globalizations, there's been a need to tie identity to to people, right? So that um, people can engage with um, governments, with institutions, access certain financial transactions and other services. And over the years, you've seen that biometric technologies have really emerged as tools that could help us address challenges with identification because somebody can easily claim to be somebody who he or she is not. So if there's a way that we can um, sort of tie identity to people, then it becomes something that is good. And biometric technologies have um, gone a long way to, to help solve that problem. They also provide a very good way for us to automate these systems, like systems of identification and make them more reliable and, and accurate. Now, there are kind of type, types or maybe compositions of these kind of identification systems. Some, we have what we call attributed um, identifiers where we attribute certain things to people. So like name, social security, numbers, driver's license, etc. Also, um, biographical identif identifiers like addresses and professions. And most um, importantly, biometric identifiers like face prints and fingerprints of people. Now, there's a bit of comparison. This is just a, a way of comparing between different biometric systems where we have iris scanning, which is quite um, accurate, very expensive. It requires active participation of subjects and is quite intrusive. We have fingerprinting. Fingerprinting has a, um, a very good historical legacy because we've been using it for quite some time across different countries and it's relatively inexpensive compared to other systems like iris scanning and also involves active participation of the subjects. Now to the focus of today's discussion, which is facial recognition. Um, facial recognition, it's quite a bit sophisticated. Um, but then one important takeaway that I want us to have from this slide is that facial recognition can exist without the, the, the explicit knowledge and cooperation of subjects, which um, serves as a very strong basis for discussing ethical issues concerning uh, facial recognition. And it can also be done at um, relatively further distances compared to the other um, forms of biometric um, identification. So usually the workflow for re facial recognition technology is usually first to detect an image or prove an image. Then the image is normalized and to conform with um, certain standards in a, in a gallery or in a, in a, in a database. Then the, we have certain features extracted from the image and then it's called the extractive features are compared with what we have in a gallery or in a database and then the image is recognized. And when the image is recognized, then it goes to serve the specific purpose that you want to use it for, whether you want to use it for verification, for identification or for other applications. So usually you can categorize um, facial recognition softwares or facial recognition technology taxing in three broad categories like we have verification, identification, and watch list. In verification, basically, you are trying to um, assess whether I, someone or a subject is the person he or she claims to be. So what happens is that that person um, submits the, his face ID or face print, and then it's cross-checked through a certain um, database. And then the database already has an image of this person to, 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 to compare with the new image that is coming in. To say, okay, yes, this is the person who claims to be to be to be to be to, to be he, him or her, right? And usually, corporations and um, government agencies have these sort of systems because to have access to certain buildings or certain classified locations, these sort of verification tax are done. The second thing is also on identification, where um, you want to be able to um, know. Um, find out 
a person. So like there's, um, you want to highlight a certain person in a crowd or you want to, somebody submits an image and you want to say, okay, this is um, Atobra or this is um, Presti or this is someone else. You want to um, be able to compare that image to a set of um, database that is collected by a certain um, mechanism to identify that this is the person. Uh, then this third application is what we call a watch list where um, uh, a person, you, you want to um, compare, like, let's say a certain image to an image on a watch list to see whether the image is already in a watch list and then compare the image in a watch list to a certain image in a gallery or data base to, to find out the identity of the person. So they're like, maybe, maybe mainly like two streams of identification here. First, the image data comes in, then it's, it's, it's first, you have, it's first assessed for whether it's in a watch list, then we com it's compared to a, a, a gallery or a database to uh, identify the person. And this is quite useful, especially for public safety, for people like labeled as maybe wanted criminals or potential terrorists or terrorists. You want to identify them in large crowds or in places so that appropriate action can be taken. Now, when it comes to performance, usually um, what happens is that facial recognition softwares have certain um, accuracies attached to them. And usually there's a, there's a trade-off when, when, when evaluating these accuracies. There's a, usually a trade-off between false reject rates and false accept rates, such that when um, a, a system has a very high false, false reject rates, people who are, who, like people can be, uh, people who are who they claim to be may not be classified as that. And then if it has a very high false accept rate, people who are not who they claim to be may be accepted to be as who they claim to be. And so usually thresholds are set in order to sort of um, deal with this situation. And is there, is within, the, within the choice of these thresholds, we have issues that arise. And some of these issues will be discussed later when it comes to the threshold setting and all that. Um, this slide basically is just to highlight some um, main algorithms that are kind of employed in the facial recognition softwares to, to deal with certain scenarios. So PCAs, PCAs, PCAs like um, are used, maybe convert 2D image data into 1D and used in certain scenarios to identify images. And it works basically by saying that um, usually 90% of the difference of an image is usually captured in a very small percentage of an image. So it discusses a lot of the image data and then focuses on on a certain part and use that for, for identification purposes. And we have uh, the linear discriminant analysis and also the elastic bunch graph matching, which can discuss later on. Usually the probe image can come in different forms, right? We have video stream inputs, we can have 3D inputs, and we can also have infrared inputs. And these all have different levels of um, um, accuracy, so different levels of advantages um, with them. And you realize that in usually in 3D, 3D inputs, what happens is that the face detection is a bit difficult because you can, it can be affected by pose and illumination problems. In 3D inputs to you can help like um, change these kind of situations by maximizing the view to a 3D input, but then also has some of these um, issues with pose and illumination. Then we have infrared that is basically based on the thermal difference between like the skin and the environment to sort of identify people's faces. Now we come to the main concerns. So there are a lot of concerns regarding facial recognition technology and softwares. Some of them are technical. Some of them are also like um, moral and political. So on a technical base, you, you realize that the, the way in which the database or the galleries are generated is also an issue. So usually for verification tax, um, usually for employees, they can they readily submit their sort of um, data to be first enrolled into a database by virtue of working for a company. And so in that case, you can create the database in a controlled environment. But in other instances like identification and watch listing, 
the database is usually created in an uncontrolled environment. Then, uh, which can have um, problems when it comes to the quality of the data and, and all that. And this will have issues when it comes to the classic the identification and problems that we will discuss. Now, we can also have issues such as data breaches. So, as we've seen in the previous discussion, like for any system that's like that takes people's data and is stored in a central location, it's not immune to breaches. So, usually, when you every every system will want to try to um, protect itself against breaches, then we have issues with algorithmic bias where some of the algorithms um, perform very well for um, certain for by for performs very well by identifying certain groups of people better than others and we will look at that in the in the in the next um slide so the moral and political implication is we have the private we have issues with privacy fairness freedom and, and autonomy and security and i'll take them one by one so on the issue of privacy the privacy is a major concern because Facial recognition is a bit intrusive, especially um, um, in terms of the amount of information it get gathers from somebody. But you know, that in and of itself may not be a problem if the person there's active consent. So what happens is that if people cannot readily, like freely consent to, to using facial recognition systems, then their privacy is being violated. For example, like if there's mass surveillance by certain governments on people, then we cannot say there's an active consent from these people. And so there's, there's, there exists a strong violation of their privacy. One other thing I like to highlight is that usually a person can give a consent, but if the alternative to no consenting is too high, then we cannot say that uh, that consent is actually informed. So for example, if deciding not to um, submit to a, a certain way of facial recognition or surveillance means you cannot access certain public places or certain places in society then we cannot say that consent is informed so in order to address these sort of issues certain recommendations have to be made one like subjects should really be aware of the of what the, the purpose of what their image is going to be used for and their specific applications there, there should be acts there should be policies that protect the distribution of that data, that, that image data that they have, especially to third parties to, um, to which they, are, they do not have contact with. And also, um, they should be aware that, like, they should be aware that the, 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 the images that have been captured, like, they have, they, they, they have the ability to opt out from these sort of systems and the fallout from that opt out should not be too great for us to see that they've had a very good consent and they've relinquished their privacy. The next issue, which is very important, is fairness. We've seen that technically some of these uh, algorithms have problems when it comes to um, the way the database is collected and the diversity of the database. So what happens is that invariably, inevitably, some of these algorithms um, 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 work well for other groups of people or other demographics compared to other demographics. So you, you, you see that most white males usually are well classified. Young white males are usually well classified, like identified compared to, let's say, minorities or specifically, let's say, African-American women in terms of disparity. You could have 100% identification for young white males and you can have around 60% for young um, um, white, uh, young black females. What happens is that Mis misidentification can have problems, especially in societies where there's underlying inequality. So if um, these systems misclassify, um, um, let's, say, let's say a young person or a, a person of minority and the person is undutifully like detained and all that, you realize that the, how these algorithms are going to entrench, are going a long way to entrench these sort of um, biases within the underlying society. So, that's that's one one thing that these systems have to look at. Then we have, in, in terms of freedom and autonomy, one major issue with this, in my opinion, is um, the agency of people. If people cannot freely be themselves, uh, then it's a problem. And you have that, especially in places where um, facial recognition has can be developed or has been developed to a very high degree of efficiency, where people cannot freely and be themselves, 
right? Then their, their, their ability to do the things that they feel more happy about becomes very problematic and curtailed. And uh, it's, it's very important for us to look at um, facial like recognition technology or technologies in general that allow surveillance to be much more easy to, to, to consider this point because then essentially we create societies where individuals cannot freely be themselves. Then the other issue is um, security. So um, the reason why security in this case is particularly important is that as societies, we operate under the assumption that, let's say, um, body, body features are very difficult to falsify or nearly impossible. So we, we trust fingerprints because we, see, we think to a large degree, people cannot easily forge their fingerprints. And also in terms of face prints, we, we accept that it's very difficult or likely uh, the, or the cost of changing your face or something, it's not too simple. So um, people cannot easily falsify this. For example, if there's a breach or the, somebody takes data from a database, whether the person is in government or is in a, is in a company and uses it in a particular place, the individual whose data has been taken cannot really, cannot really defend him or herself very well, like in, in, in places where his bi bi biometric data, especially in this case, face print data has been used in a certain place. It becomes very difficult to show that disconnect. So, it's, it's important that we, we accept that in terms of security, dealing with, um, let's say, face, face print um, data is, is very, like, um, it's much more serious, uh, especially in, in this context. Now, I'd like to wrap up with a few other things where I look at, um, I think we should look at facial recognition technology in third world countries. So we've seen over the years that um, countries like China who are really leading um, um, AI and driving a lot of these technological innovations are really expanding to other places. So for example, we've had like we've had instances since 2018 come in where China is selling facial recognition technology to countries like Zimbabwe, Angola, and Ethiopia. And the, the, the main argument here is that well, Chinese firms want to diversify their databases with African images. And, they also provide a platform for African countries to monitor their population. Here, I think the main ethical concern is not really about the inherent problems with facial recognition technologies, whether they are not efficient. But here, the real danger can lie in when they become very efficient. So, for example, if you look at if you look at it, um, China China essentially creating the the, the, the software and distributing the software and owning most of these platforms means they are going to have access to a lot of um, biometric data from Africans, especially people who cannot provide like objective and active consent. So in most places, these, these deals can be made with governments and people are like just um, um, subject to this technology without their, their active, let's say, consent. And most African countries would not have very good data protection laws. And it means like people themselves do not have really strong autonomy over their data in such locations. And the other thing is also on the issue of monitoring of population. So if um, these, these um, governments, for example, some of them have been seen to be, have been known to be a bit brutal or being repressive, like if these systems are well developed, right, in, in that context, it means it becomes much more easier for these regimes to be a bit more brutal in that context. So I'd like to end by talking about the complex like dynamics of the, of the stakeholders involved. So you realize that there are different layers of stakeholders when it comes to facial recognition um, technology. Within countries, we have the developers, right, who, who want to push this sort of um, 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 systems or who work to develop these sort of algorithms or systems. And we have citizens that, um, um, especially in first world countries, know their data protection rights and they can know in what context they can engage with such technology. And we have the governments in those cases that protects them or that um, facilitates the active engagement between the consumers and the producers or the, the developers. But also on a global scale, you realize that there's also another sort of stakeholder um, issue going on where we have countries that are leading this development and countries that are exporting them to other places. So how the, 
countries also engage with such technologies on a global level becomes also an issue because um, in, in, in that case, the issue of ownership of this kind of data becomes a problem. At what point do we see this sort of data exploitation is too high? Like all these are open questions that can be discussed. Um, thank you very much for your attention and, and some of my references.